Well, turn in your Bibles to John's second letter. We're going to cover the first uh, six verses of that letter this morning. We just finished uh, his first letter over the last couple months, and we'll spend a few weeks here um, in his second and third letter. Second and third John are actually the the two shortest books or letters in the New Testament. Uh, It's less than 300 words. It would actually fit on a single little small piece of papyrus that would be easily passed on on the Roman roads to different churches. So it's a very small little letter uh, that we're studying uh, in the next few weeks. So this morning we'll read the first six verses of 2 John. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments, This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would use your word to inspire and encourage us, strengthen us in our faith and the promises of the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, this morning, let me ask you a question. How many of you are tempted... um, to splurge on an item at the store occasionally, or to do some impulsive shopping um, every now and then. I see a couple hands raising. Some of you are too young to be raising hands uh, in the back there. Maybe, maybe perhaps you've had a bad day or a bad week, and so maybe spending a little bit of money buying something helps you feel better. Um, I saw a store recently, I think it was in Beaufort, called, the name of the store was called Retail Therapy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And you get the message there. So maybe you feel compulsion to buy something. Maybe it's clothes or a pair of shoes or some power tools. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a book. Uh, maybe it's a new tech gadget or something that you want to buy uh, that you feel compelled to buy. Or maybe you just got in your tax return the last few months and you start spending money and it helps you feel better. And you think to yourself, it's not a lot of money. It's not going to ruin the budget. Unless you're splurging on a new boat or a new car, it's not a lot of money. It may be 50 bucks or 100 bucks or something. And you think, well, I deserve this. This will make me feel better. I think a lot of us do that. Actually, what I read this past week is that 85% of Americans admit to doing that regularly. That's what most folks do. One lady I read about, her name is Trina. She lives in Michigan. She said it's not unusual for her to go to Target for toothpaste, and when she leaves the store, she spent $75 not on toothpaste, on other stuff. Um, that was her story. And so I read about that. And, and it can be, you know, if you think about it, it can be damaging behavior. Um, it can hurt your budget if you do that too much. Or it can be addictive if you think this is what's going to make me feel better. And you think you're going to find peace through the, the credit card. When scripture says peace is a gift from God through the Lord Jesus Christ as we receive his Holy Spirit. Well, one financial company I read about last week has designed this new app that's to help you prevent, to help prevent you from impulsive, compulsive spending. It's to help you keep on your budget, save money. And this app is called, I don't have it, honestly, um, so I don't know if it works or not, so you can check it out this week if you'd like. But the app is called Splurge Alert, in case you're splurging on things you shouldn't. And, he, and here's how it works. You identify certain stores or restaurants or places that you struggle to uh, keep your checkbook or your credit cards in your, in your wallet or in your bag. And you identify those stores, and so it uses geomapping technology. So when you're close to that store, it alerts you that you're close, and you need to be on guard and protect your money. But more than that, the alert goes one step beyond that. You sign up different friends who know you have this problem. And when you get close to these stores, it alerts your three or four or five friends that you are close to that store or restaurant. And so that they can immediately begin to text you or call you to help you, prevent you from spending that money. It's to help keep you accountable. 
And so it keeps you accountable, makes you stop and reflect and think about that purchase before you go in and spend 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it is. Another lady in this story I read about on this new app, her name is Sonia. She's 37. She says she's trying to save um, $1,300 for her daughter this year, and she says this app is going to limit her impulsive and compulsive spending and help her save money for something her daughter, a trip or something her daughter is doing later this year. Another person said they had a weakness for smoothies and sushi, and this app is going to help this person save a few hundred dollars this year by not just splurging on a smoothie or on sushi. And so this new app is designed to help you, uh, keep you accountable, and keep you alert to the disciplines of, or the danger rather, of undisciplined spending. Financial actions that can hurt your budget, can hurt relationships with others, actions that can hurt your ability to save for retirement, and it's supposed to keep you accountable and alert you to the dangers. As we begin this new letter, 2 John, this is really an alarm, an alert going out to a local church in or around the area of Ephesus. It's an alert, it's an alarm. And, and what he's doing here, John's doing, is he's not trying to alert you to financial issues. He's not trying to be Dave Ramsey or, or Clark Howard and alert you to problems of finances. He's alerting the people in and around Ephesus at a local church about the problem of false teachers, of heretics, people that are not teaching biblical truth. That's what he's doing. He's alerting them to false teaching. He's sounding this alarm and trying to keep them accountable to truth, the importance of maintaining fidelity to the word of God. So that's what he's doing. And, and so this week we'll look at the first six verses. And this is more of the positive side of his message of this alert, this alarm. This is more of the optimistic, the positive side that he's heard some good reports about what's happening at this local church in or around Ephesus. And so this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at two things. Verses 1 through 3 is his greeting to Christians at this local church. And then verses 4 through 6 are guidelines for this local church that is still listening uh, to John the elder here. So let's, let's look at the first three verses, the greeting. Verse 1, he says, The elder, that's how he describes himself, to the elect lady and her children. John the Elder. So in his first letter, if you remember, John didn't identify himself. We have to study in Scripture and outside of Scripture to identify that John was the author. Here, he identifies himself as, as the Elder. And he identifies his audience, and we'll get to that in a minute. He didn't do that in the first letter. And so here he describes himself as John the Elder. And that word Elder is the word um, presbyter. John the Presbyter. And it could be one of two things. It could be a reference that John is advanced in age. It's at the end of the first century that he writes this letter. So it could be that he's, a, he's an older man advanced in years. It could also be a reference to his position as a spiritual leader among that church or other churches. It could be one of those. It could be both of those. We're not really sure what, what he's identifying. But it could be both. And the people he's writing to, they understand who he is, and they are going to receive his authoritative words to them. They understand that he is the last living apostle. He was one, not like us, one who was commissioned to write scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. And so they're going to receive his words with authority. And so he says, John the elder, to the elect lady and her children. And so the question is, elect lady and her children. Is, is John writing to a Presbyterian woman near Ephesus? Is that what he's doing? Is John writing to this woman and her family? And is he writing to a woman named Electa? That's the Greek, Electa. Probably not. Some folks think so, but probably not. And there's a couple reasons why we think he's, he's not doing that. Number one, as we read through this morning and next week, the language is really not appropriate for, for John writing to a specific person, a woman, um, in this town of Ephesus. Um, it's not appropriate language for a real person, either in his statement in verses 1 through 2, his statement of love, his exhortation to love in verse 3, and in verse 5, it, would be, it wouldn't sound right for John to call his love for this woman a direct command. It doesn't line up with a specific person. Second of all, as we read through this, uh, it's not real clear in the English, but in the Greek it's more clear. He's using second person plural pronouns. You plural. You, the Greek equivalent or the English equivalent of that Greek would be y'all. He's writing to y'all in Ephesus. And so it's more than one person. It's a group of people. And we see that in the Greek. Let's so read this. And then thirdly, this is a common thing in, in the Old and New Testament to identify a church um, as a, with feminine personification. And so if you've read through some of the Old Testament, you see that 
the church, the people of God, is referred to as a wife, the bride, the mother. Um, sometimes uh, Lamentations 1, after the fall of Jerusalem, Jeremiah says they're a widow because of what's happened in, in uh, Lamentations 1, daughter of Zion in the Old Testament. And we see that also in the New Testament as well. Paul uses that in 2 Corinthians 11. It says the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, Peter says she, the church, who is in Babylon, meaning Rome. So we see that that is used throughout Scripture, that churches are identified with feminine personification. And so it seems here that John is writing to, not to a person, but to a local church in or around Ephesus. And it's hard to know why he does that. Perhaps he's just... Uh, adapting to local customs, that could be part of it. Another reason he could be doing this is if the church there is under persecution in Ephesus, this would be a way to keep them anonymous. And so this small little letter, it would have been a very small little piece of papyrus, could be transmitted down Roman roads to this church. And if anyone intercepted it and wanted to hurt the Christians there, they wouldn't know who he was addressing. And so it could be to protect these people. But he writes to these people. He says... To all who know the truth. That's what he says here in the beginning of these verses. And so I'm going to get to the importance of truth in verses 4 through 6. But here at this point it's worth noting that John is acknowledging the fact that some are knowing the truth and following it and others are not. Some in that area have departed from truth and departed from the local church. Some people have been misled by false teachers by people who are leading others astray. Some people have removed themselves from the Christian church because they believe false things that are not true. And some of these people have given in to cultural pressures. Some have given up the truth. And so John is acknowledging that here in the opening verses, that some have not been faithful. And so he adds, he says, the truth that abides in them. And that's a word that we've seen that John likes to use in his gospel and in in his first letter. That word abide or resting. That truth rests, abides in them. And he's going to tell us that it rests and abides in them forever. It's not temporary. It's not just on a Sunday morning. It's not just based on how you feel. It's an eternal presence in the life of someone who's following the Lord Jesus Christ. It's eternal. And they possess that truth, as we'll see, through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Through knowing him and following him, they have that in them because they possess Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, John 14, 6. And so they have that because they know that Christ has died on the cross for their sins. He's risen again and gives them the promise of eternal life as they repent and follow him. And and so to know Christ is to know truth and to possess that. It's not something we earn or can work hard and achieve. It's something that we receive through repentance and through faith in Jesus Christ. And so to these people here, John writes this. He says, Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth, there's that word again, truth, and love. And so John here is not wishing them grace, mercy, and peace. He's not saying, hope you'll have a great day, grace, mercy, and peace. He's not just wishing that to them, wishing they have a nice day as they leave worship. He's not even offering a prayer for them here in this verse. He's not praying that they have grace, mercy, and peace. Rather, what John is doing, if you look closely at the verse, he is affirming that truth, that truth for them, grace, mercy, and peace, it exists for them now, will be with us. And the Greek is very emphatic, will be with you now, is what he says. Grace, mercy, and peace. And so he's giving them a confident word of assurance. He's saying, you have this. You are united together as one people of God through the bond of truth, and you have that grace, you have that mercy, you have that peace of God. And they have God's grace because they know that God has sent his son to die on the cross for them. They have that mercy because they've been spared the wrath of God on sin. And they have that peace that they know that God is their father. He's not their judge. Their sins are forgiven. And so they have a relationship with him. God offers us mercy because of the gracious gift of his son. And and those who know Christ know that peace that they have even today. And they don't wrestle. And you and I should not wrestle too much with that, that we have to make God happy, that we have to work harder to accomplish something, that we have to stress over, does God love us? Is God doing what's best for us? We know that he'll do that. We've given our lives to him. He's given his life to us at the cross. And so we know we can trust him. We know he's our heavenly father. 
and we know it's grace, mercy, and peace. It's not a wish. It's not a desire we have. It's something that we have, we claim, because of what Christ has done for us. And so John's greetings here in these first few verses are to those people who are faithful to the word of God in this local church and continue to follow the truth despite false teachers who maybe they sound good, maybe they're articulate, maybe they have a great message that they're selling. But these people have rejected it because it's not true. It's not in line with the truth of Scripture. And so John assures them that they have the grace of God. They have the mercy of God. They have the peace of God, even today. And we need that reminder as well if we're following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's his greeting to these people. And so with those greetings accomplished, now verses 4 through 6, we're going to look at two guidelines that he gives them, two guidelines for these Christians in this local church. And so the first guideline is truth. So John is already in the first three verses. He's mentioned that word truth four times. Look at verse 1. He says, whom I love in the truth. Also in verse 1, all who know the truth. Verse 2, because of the truth that abides in us, that rests in us. And then verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace be with us in truth and in love. So those are four times in three verses. And then now, as he gives these guidelines, he mentions it another time. So he's wanting people to get the message of truth here. He says in verse 4, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. And so John is saying here, he's heard a report of this local church in Ephesus. He's heard that they're walking in the truth. And we don't know how he heard that. Maybe someone visited John. Maybe he wasn't traveling as much in his age. And so they gave him a report. Maybe that's how it happened. Maybe someone wrote another letter to John. And he heard about what was going on in that church and was encouraged by it. But he's heard this positive report. And actually here, the the Greek word is that word eureka. He has discovered, he's found out something about these folks. And so we might say, John said this eureka moment. He's heard, discovered that they are walking in truth, despite the presence of these people who are attacking the church of Christ through their false teaching. He's discovered this, and he says they're walking in truth. And so truth here is likened to a path or a road that you follow, that you continue on. And these people here have not wandered off to the left. They've not wandered off to the right. They've followed truth. They've not gotten lost in the woods. They haven't started believing different views on Jesus Christ. They haven't started believing different views on morality or on ethics, on right and wrong. They've followed scripture. And if if anything, that's a helpful reminder for us this morning, today. We can be tempted to believe some of God's word, some of it. There's some nice things in this book, and not, be, and not be affirmed to believe all of it. We can be tempted to compromise some of our views, the views of Scripture, and compromise our views on what's right or wrong, or on morality, on truth. And so John says they're walking in the truth, they're maintaining truth, and he's encouraged by that. And I think John gives this guideline on truth, it could be for numerous reasons. This morning I'll just mention a couple reasons I think he may give this. The first is... It's easy in many ways to counterfeit the appearance of Christianity. It's easy to counterfeit the appearance of Christianity. Especially here in South Carolina in the low country, it's very common. People can say, I'm, yeah, I'm a Christian, but not really believe the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And to believe Christ, you must believe his word. He's commissioned the writers of scripture. So you can't just say, I'm a Christian, and not follow what he says. So individuals can give the appearance of being a Christian and not believe the promises of the gospel. If individuals can do it, a group of people can do it. Local churches can. They can claim they can have Presbyterian on the sign and not really be Christian. They can have Methodist on the sign. I might even say Anglican on the sign and not be truly following Scripture. And so unless we're remaining in truth, Those gatherings of people that are appearing to be Christian are are nothing more than social clubs if they don't have the truth of Scripture to follow. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, the people of Mount Pleasant, the people of Charleston, the last thing they need is more counterfeit Christianity. People who are Christians on Sunday morning and then live a different life the rest of the week. People who show up on Sunday morning, dressed up, ready to go, but then live by a different set of values Monday through Saturday. People of our town don't need any more of those people I think we've got plenty of them, honestly. One writer said that Christianity can be counterfeited by those who present the appearance of Christianity 
but not the reality, not the substance, not the truth of Christianity. I was reading this past week, uh, Bishop Allison, uh, the late bishop, um, Anglican bishop of the Diocese of South Carolina, he said this. He said, too often when lost people come to church, many people only find a reflection of the world, and they go away from the church empty. And then he added, Bishop Allison added, present-day leaders in churches, and this is a word to us as leaders in the church, have replaced the search for truth with the acquisition of power and authority. And that, that's a condemnation of many church leaders, and I would say that applies in Charleston and Mount Pleasant. Um, that truth has lost its value, and it's about acquisition of power over people. And so our city, Mount Pleasant, Charleston, needs people, men and women, boldly following the Lord Jesus Christ and embracing the truth revealed in Scripture about Christ and about his word. And we do that, and I say this emphatically, we do it even when some parts of Scripture we struggle with. Some parts of Scripture we don't fully understand, but we know it's there. We wrestle with it. We still affirm it even if it makes us a little bit uncomfortable to say, yeah, I believe that. Scripture teaches that. I'm, I'm wrestling with it, but Scripture teaches it. And so John emphasizes truth here because Christianity is often counterfeited. Second reason I'll mention here is that we have the tendency, the proclivity, to make ourselves the arbiters of truth. We have this instinct, a sinful instinct, that leads us to believe that we can decide what's true and what's not true. We're tempted to an inflated sense of our ability to judge between what's right and what's wrong, truth and falsehood. And that was a problem for John. It's a problem for us in 2016. A couple generations ago, C.S. Lewis wrote in one of his essays, he said, the ancient man long ago approached God as a person approaches his judge. That's how they used to do it. Today, the modern man, the roles are reversed. The modern man says he is the judge, and God is in the dock. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man, us, we are on the bench, and God is in the dock. And we are judging God to decide if we'll believe in him or not, whether he adds up to what we believe. And that's not how it works. God's not in the dock, we are. We don't sit as judge and jury over what's true and false. We don't sit on the bench and decide. One day we stand before him, and he decides about us. The law says that we're all guilty in Scripture. The gospel says through Jesus Christ, you're not guilty because Christ has taken that on, that sin, the punishment for sin on himself. And so you can have confidence. You don't have to go to death afraid. You can go with the hope that Christ has taken that on himself. And so that when you appear before God as your judge, he's your heavenly father, and he welcomes you. And Scripture gives us that promise. That's not my word. That's God's word. And so I can say it with full confidence. We can stand before him with that confidence. And so this morning it's a reminder that God has revealed his will for us in Scripture. He's revealed truth. And we must resist that desire, that temptation to accommodate cultural changes. To fit what the secularists would want us to, to, to follow. God's revealed truth through his son, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his word. And we are to know truth. We are to believe truth. And the hard part is to live that out in Mount Pleasant, in Charleston. And your neighbors, your co-workers need to see that in all of us. And so the, the first guideline this morning is to remain faithful to the truth of God's word, to follow it, to follow the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And the second guideline that we'll cover quickly here is to love God and love others. Verse 5, he says, I write not a new commandment, but the one we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. So John is telling them here, not only do you need to stay rooted in biblical truth, stay rooted in the truth of who Jesus Christ is, fully God, fully human, died on the cross for your sins. Not only that, but a group of Christians is bonded together as a communion based on that truth, and they demonstrate their adherence to that truth by loving others, loving God and loving others. And so John adds to that. He says, I'm going to define love for you. John says, love isn't just being a nice person. It's not just avoiding being disagreeable. Love isn't just being a tolerant person. Love isn't a Sunday morning disposition or a Sunday morning activity. In verse 6, if you look at verse 6, he tells us what love actually is. He says, this is love, that we walk or we live 
according to his commandments. And so it's a helpful definition that love is obeying what God has revealed about himself and his will for us in scripture. Do you want to be a loving person? Then be an obedient person. Be obedient to his word, to scripture. To love others, you have to first love God and obey his word. And we can have confidence to obey his word because we know it's true. That's the relationship with truth. And there's confidence obeying the Lord because he's worthy of our trust. And he'll do what's best for us. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, our city needs to see more loving people who are obedient to God's word. Not just being nice and tolerant and agreeable and getting along, but people who are obedient to the word of God and demonstrating that in service to others. So the question this morning is, do they see that in you? Do they see that in in our church plant here in Mount Pleasant? Do others see each of us as as individuals who are truly obedient to the Lord? Those are the two guidelines he gives us this morning, truth and love. And truth is the foundation for the people of God. It's what unites us. Without truth, you can't really have true unity in a church. And we'll get into that a little bit more next week as we get into some of his other statements. But a commitment to truth demonstrates itself in loving others. And because you're committed to obeying the word of God, you'll be committed to serving others, serving those people that God brings in your life who have needs, who need you to help them. And so this morning, as I thought about over the past week, these two guidelines of truth and love for our church, I thought about our church plant. I thought about truth and love in light of our church plant. And I wondered, you know, hypothetically, how John would describe our new church. What would John say about Shem Creek Prez? as a church plant, as a mission church. I mean, we're a small group of folks meeting here. We've been meeting here on Sunday mornings for, I think, nine or ten months, less than a year. So what would John say about us? What would John the Elder say about us? Would he say we're committed to truth? With so many other churches in our area compromising biblical truth, would John say, I've I've had a eureka moment. I've discovered truth. I've heard this news about Shem Creek Prez, that they are faithful and walking in truth. Would John say, I've discovered and heard that you are demonstrating that commitment to truth by loving and serving others. And so would the report back to John be one that he's encouraged by if he heard about us? My prayer is that as a new church plant for Mount Pleasant, for Charleston, we would be committed to truth and committed to serving others in obedience to God's commands. And as John said in his first letter, Several weeks ago, we talked about this. It should not be a burden to follow the Lord, to obey him and to serve others. It shouldn't feel like a weight that we carry on our shoulders, that it's difficult, that we have to obey the Lord and do his commands. It shouldn't feel like that. It should be a response to those who have experienced the grace of God, the mercy of God, and know that their sins are forgiven, that they have the hope of eternal life. And that the hope of materialism, of more stuff in this world is not going to satisfy them, but giving their life back to the Lord who gave his life for them is the response of those who have had the grace, mercy, and peace of God in their life. They know that God has spared them from the punishment of sin. It's a response to those who have the peace of God. They've placed their faith in Christ, and they know their sins are forgiven. They know God is their heavenly Father. He's not their condemning judge. And because of that, John said in his first letter, the burden is light. There is no burden for those who are following the Lord. And the message here, it's not a burden if we remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins on the cross. Because it's at the cross where we see the grace of God and see him demonstrate mercy to people like you and me who would never be, will never be good enough to earn it or deserve it. He didn't go to the cross to die for good people. He went to the cross and died for us. Our response is to be committed to truth and to love others, to serve others. And the gospel reminds us of that. It's a declaration of what God's done for us. Our response is to believe it, affirm it, and demonstrate it to others, loving them and serving them in our community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the gospel reminders that you've died on the cross for us, that you have purchased our redemption if we repent of our sins and put our faith in you, 
Because of that, we know your grace. We've experienced your mercy, and we have your peace. And we thank you for that. I pray that each of us here would know that, would experience that, and would demonstrate that. Help our unbelief, Lord. Sometimes we wrestle with these truths, and we doubt. So help our unbelief. And as we think through these promises, Lord, you have instituted your sacrament as a pillar, as a, a way to strengthen our faith when it, when it wavers. And so we pray that you would strengthen and affirm our faith through the sacrament that you've instituted, that your Holy Spirit would unite us to Christ through these elements this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.